Uh, Revelations chapter one, uh, 21. Revelations chapter 21. And let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship where we've assembled and gathered together as your church family, Lord God. We pray that, Father, we come seeking wisdom and truth and understanding concerning your word. We pray that this word would go forth with clarity and understanding and plant in our hearts and minds truth and life and light which is found in your word. We thank you for blessing our fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to read three little sections of the book of Revelations. Verse 7 says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And we're going to read three different sections, but let me just back up here and just talk a little bit about the book of Revelations. When you look at the New Testament, the, uh, the Gospels cover about 33 years. Uh, it's the life of Jesus. In the Gospels, you'll see his birth all the way through you know, to his death, burial, and resurrection. The book of Acts and the epistles uh, cover really from the, from the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the, the, the power of God coming on humanity, and, and it's the launching of men and women into a new ministry, into a new thing, right? Because before that, we had the prophet, the priest, and the king. We had Jesus. And then in the book of Acts, that was transitioned over to humanity. In fact, it opens with all that Jesus began to do and teach. In other words, he started it, and then we take it over. And then we see the epistles and the, and the letters to the church which spans about 30 more years after his death, like maybe 40 years. Uh, and then we have the book of Revelations. And when you, when you study the Bible and you read through the New Testament, if you read through it, there, there's sort of a different voice from God in, in the Gospels and in the New Testament letters in the book of Revelations. In, in the Gospels, we see a lot of uh, historical things. We see Jesus... Uh, uh, dealing with uh, his guys very tenderly. Uh, you, know, you know, you look at Peter, and we see Peter, uh, when he denied Jesus and Jesus came back, we see him talking to Peter and saying, Peter, do you love me? You know, feed my sheep. And Peter saying, yes, I love you. And there's two different words for love there, and there's an interaction, but it's very tender. Uh, we see in the, the epistles, we really learn how to grow to be the church. We really learn our rights. We learn, uh, you know, how church is supposed to be structured. We learn, you know, most of what we're supposed to do, you know, as the church and live as the church. When we get to the book of Revelations, the thing that I think is the most interesting is, you know, it is the end book, but the voice of God toward his people changes drastically. And, 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 in when you, when you look at the epistles and you look at, you know, book of Ephesians or Philippians, and you look at the book of Revelations, it, it's like you're talking to, you know, teenagers and young adults. When you get to the book of Revelations, it's, you know, here, let me give you an example. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep, right? And Romans says, you know, uh, he that spared not his own son, you know, how, how will he not deliver us from all things? Amen. And so we see this tenderness. In the book of Revelations, we see him tell the Ethesian church, you're either going to love me the way you did or I'm going to fire you. I'm going to terminate your job. And, and we see a much more mature voice of God to the church. And when you go through the seven letters, it's almost like you've had 60 years of the Holy Spirit. You've had signs and wonders. You've had miracles. You've had my voice in the earth. It's really time for you to live the life I've called you to live and to be who you're called to be. And, you know, when, when I, because when you compare them, when you look at them, how he treated Peter, Peter didn't have the Holy Spirit. He didn't have the, you know, the book of Ephesians, and he didn't have the history. And when we get to the book of Revelations, we see that history now maturing. And so that voice is much different. So a lot of times, teachers or, or those studying the Bible, you know, they, they sort of look at the book of Revelations and they can't, you know, come to grips with it. But what really what 
what we're getting is a very sober message about the reality of the situation that we're in, the reality of what's coming. You know, it is the last book of the Bible, and it does historically cover events that we haven't walked through yet. Uh, but at the same time, when you look at the seven letters, you know, some people believe that those letters were for, um, you know, for the church of that day. Others believe that they're phases of history. And, uh, and, and as I believe, they're, they're letters to, to the church at every point in history. You know, whether it was the 1800s or 1900s or this century, the, any one of those churches, any one of our churches could fall into one of those traps. So that, that's what I believe. So today we're going to look at a very sobering sort of message from the Lord. The Lord gave me three things. I'll sort of tell you where he wants us to go as I lead you through it. He spoke to me and he said, those that, that, are, that do not have a whole heart toward me will be swept away. Those that don't have a whole heart toward me, toward what's coming, will be swept away. He told me, knowing about the events does not prepare you to live through the events. Because you know them doesn't mean you can live through them. You know, Peter knew that he was going to deny Jesus three times before the cock crowed, right? Before the rooster crowed, yet... He still did what the Lord said he would do. He was still weak, right? And then, and then the last thing is, the American church is at somewhat of a disadvantage for what's coming. Because it's hard for us to conceptualize some of the things that the Bible talks about. You know, we've never been invaded on our soil. If you, if you take a, a German or you take somebody from France, there's a generation of people that lost their homes that gave it all because of a war that happened in their history. We've never experienced that. We, we've been sort of the top of the food chain since, you know, really in the last century. You know, nothing's happened here as we read through these events that we can even comprehend what it would be like to live through that event. You know, so we're at a, somewhat of a disadvantage when you look at end times because the Bible tells us that the entire earth will be consumed. Now there'll be pockets of mercy and nations that won't go as far, but will be consumed with Antichrist. And we'll look at those, at those things here. Now as we look, you're going to see a thread, because again, we're, those without a whole heart in, in, in their walk, in their life with Jesus, will be swept away or taken away, which means they will compromise, they will surrender, they will merge into something that's not God. That's, that's what that means. They'll fall away. They'll, 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 they'll give up. They'll apostate. And, uh, and then knowing about the events, remember, doesn't necessarily mean you're prepared to live through them. And then the last one was the American church is at a disadvantage. So as we look here, verse 7. Now this is at the end of end, but I'm going to go backwards. It says, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. So immediately, what does overcome mean? He who... Who, who prevails, he who conquers, he who is able to get through, he, he who is able to keep the faith through the process, will inherit. And, and then he goes on to say, and I will be his God and he shall be my son, but the cowardly. Now here we see for the first time in scripture, because we, we see sexually immoral, we see sorcerers, idolaters, we see you know, uh, uh, um, you know, adultery. We see a whole list of sins in scriptures. This is the first time that we see the fearful or, or the cowardly would be judged as a sinner. And, and so, you know, when you, when you back up for it, why is it there? You know, what's he, what's he trying to tell us? When you go over to Revelations 14, just go back a few more pages... Verse 9 says, then, the, then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out at full strength, in other words, not diluted, into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of his holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment shall ascend forever and ever. They will have no rest a day or a night 
who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. And so now we see something where, you know, where we're moving back. The last scripture we looked at was at the end of all things. This scripture is really looking into great tribulation. So in other words, it's still an event in the future, but the Bible tells us some things here. It says there's no coming back. If you take this mark, you have to understand, it's not like, uh, it's not like applying for a visa. It's, it's worshiping Antichrist, the system of Antichrist, taking the mark so you can't buy or sell. So it's an allegiance. The best example I can give you that you can comprehend is Adolf Hitler. It's you, 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 you sign up for the regime to back the regime, to back the man, to back his policies above God, family, and everything else. Okay, so it's like it's like a man like that in power, that that you not you not only worship, you not only think he's a great man. What does that mean? You think he's a great man. He's above other men, but you actually you're actually buying in and drinking the Kool Aid of who the man is and what he stands for. So it's not you're not going to be you know you're not going to falsely join or or secretly join. You're going to have people at that time. Whether you know whatever your doctrine may be on, Revel, on on rapture, people whatever you believe, wherever you believe, people at that time will have a decision to do away with their Christianity or to buy into him during great tribulation. Where and where, by the way, it says that he will have a mark where you won't be able to buy or sell. You know, so I'm trying to draw a picture for you. Of you know, because the the Bible's telling us this. The Bible's telling us that men and women will be confronted with this idea of having to join in to be able to live and sustain life. And the Bible says if anyone does that, it, it almost leaves no room for redemption to come back out of it. In other words, it's, it, it, you're sealed in your fate by stepping into that. Do you guys see that? Okay, go over to Revelation 13. And verse 7. And it was, it was granted unto him and him as Antichrist to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Now, verse 7, those of you that have been coming for a while, when, when we teach in end times, understand something. If, if any authority is given, if any you know, um, uh, ability or authority is given, it's always given by God. Whether he, whether he does it, or he allows it. He is the final authority on who has authority. Okay? So when it says it was granted unto him, God's behind it. To make war with the saints, those are believers, and to overcome them, an authority was given unto him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads, leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. And so now we, we see when we talk about Antichrist, even before he comes in, we see that God gives him great authority. God allows him, but we see that the world embraces him. The world... The world um, worships or follows, he's going to be widely accepted and widely viewed as a great man. The average humanity will deify him, will lift him up, will worship him, and we that know the truth and are discerning will see it, will fight against it, right? And as we're fighting against it, the herd is going one direction and we're going against it. Do you follow? So it's going to be very difficult at that time because you're talking about the masses following in line to jump in with him, to go with him where he is going because they believe he's taking humanity to a better place. They believe that things are better under him. They believe that his wisdom and knowledge has brought peace, which is a, which is a false kind of peace, and that his wisdom and knowledge has made everyone better and therefore, they're going to tolerate him, even if they do have some religious beliefs. 
So while the herd is moving that way, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to be moving directly against it. And people are going to look at you and are going to say, are you crazy that you would get, be, get against this man who has brought about this peace, who has brought about, and it's, again, let's try to conceptualize, because it's hard for us. Let's look at Hitler. He brought about a better life. He, he, the, he, the Volkswagen, the people had jobs, zero unemployment. Everyone was working. Everything was moving. Big pride within the nation. And so as he's going, they saluted him. Heil Hitler. Hitler lives forever. That's what that means. And, and, and so we have this whole culture behind a type of antichrist because there's food on the table and things are better, turning a blind eye to what's going on, getting behind him. So if you're against him, you're against the man that made life better for us. How can that be wrong? Do you guys see that? Okay, so all of this is happening when he comes on the scene. Let's look at prior. Go over to Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, and verse 3, I'm not going to go through the whole thing uh, today, but Matthew 24, really, uh, verse 3 says, Now as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? So they ask him three questions. What will be, what, when what shall these things be? has to do with the preceding verses, which has to do with the taking down of the temple, which happened in 70 AD. So Jesus said that all the buildings of the temple would be taken down. They said, when will this be? He answers that in Luke chapter 21. He doesn't answer it here. He answers two other questions here. What, be, what will be the sign of your coming? What will it be like? What will we look for? What will tell us? What will show us? What will the news cycle say? What will, we be, what will it be like as a sign that your return is getting nearer and nearer, closer and closer? And what will it be like at the end of the world, or at the end of the age, or at the end of the dispensation? So Jesus answers them chronologically here, and it, all the way to his return, what the signs will be. And it's broken up into four sections. In Luke 21, he answers the same question but he moves around with different pieces, and we'll go to that. So this is, these are the events leading up to his return. Verse 4 says, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and will deceive many. So the first thing out of his mouth was, Be warned, don't be deceived, because there's plenty of opportunity for deception. That's what that means. Many will come in his name, which means many will come in the name of Christianity. In other words, it's not going to be some foreign religion. Many will come bearing his name, bearing, bearing the name of Christ. And they'll deceive many. And many there means a lot, right? Verse 6, you'll hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation kingdom against kingdom, there will be famine and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. So around the world, he's saying, as we, and if you read verse 8, it says, all these things are the beginning of sorrows or birth pangs. And I've, I've taught this many times. You know, birth pangs, we, we can identify with that. A woman goes into labor, she gets contractions. As she gets closer to the birth, the contractions are more intense. They become closer and closer together until she gives birth. So Jesus is saying, all of these things, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famine, earthquakes, pestilence, they're going to intensify, they're going to get closer and closer together, they're going to become more frequent, all the way until I return. Okay, So, so he's telling us, these, this is like the initial sign when you see this all the time. You know, So if we look back at the last 100 years versus the previous 500 years, we see a couple of world wars, we see nuclear weapons. We see things that most of humanity has never seen or had to deal with that we're dealing with now. So he says, these are the beginning of sorrows. He said, verse 9 now turns attention to us. It says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation 
and kill you, and you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now I want you to stop there. <coughs> there has always been a refuge nation for Christianity. There's always been a predominant nation in the earth, whether it was England, France, Spain, Portugal, Germany, the United States, that sent missionaries out around the world and protected the Christian faith from around the second century. So there, there's always been a nation. But here it says that all nations will be offended at the Christian belief or the Christian walk. When I tell you this, I'm not telling you that it's somebody who identifies as a Christian. I'm telling you it's a real Christian, a person that really lives the Word of God, who sees the Word of God and believes the Word of God and lives the Word of God. Not somebody who believes they're a Christian because their dad was a Christian or mother was a Christian. This is somebody who lives that life, okay? So he's saying, here's a sign before my return. And, you know, as I prayed about this, and I prayed about this message, because I, I, was, I, I was up today at 4.30, because the message was weighing on me all night. And, and, and I said, Lord, you know, I'm, what, you know, what is it about this, these verses that gets me so anxious? So there's so much anxiety. And that's when the, 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 the American citizen, somebody who's been born and raised here, has no clue what it means to have your government hate you because of religion. We still don't. We still don't know. We're getting there. We're getting there. There's an undertow. But we don't know. We can't comprehend that. We can't understand that. Now these signs, this verse, is living and alive and true in 75% of the world. Right now. Right? You look at humanity, about 8 billion people on the face of the earth, you go to you could go to China. There's a quarter of the Earth's population there, and they can't do what we're doing right now. You know we don't understand it. We don't comprehend it because we're able to do this in freedom. But a vast majority of the Earth right now is living hated by their own government for a stand that we believe in. You and I believe in. Do you guys? Can you guys conceptualize that? That movement to our nation is one of the last signs before his return. In other words, it says all nations. So that, that adversarial relationship uh, with our government against us, we're seeing it everywhere. We're seeing take Jesus out of buildings, take him out of the schools, don't let it be in the, you know, in the media. I mean, you, you know, uh, protect all of the other religions, but don't protect Christians. It's, it's a spirit of antichrist that has done this. And, and so we haven't learned or we don't know how to live this way. You know, we're, 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 we're going to be confronted with it very soon where, where we won't be able to speak what we want to speak and say what we want to say according to what God's word says without a backlash. Imprisonment, hatred, and, and be really being an enemy of the state. And, and so as you read through, it continues. It says, and then many will be offended. Offended at what? Well, last time we've seen offended, Jesus said, when, you know, when they come to arrest me, many will be offended. They're going to they're gonna run away in fear. They're going to abandon me. You know, we see offended in John chapter 6 when he teaches on communion. So it's a type of being offended, like I didn't sign up to live through this. Okay, Betray one another, hate one another. So here you have tribulation, offended, betrayal, of, you know, hated. Many false prophets will arise and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all of the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end will come. And then verse 15 starts great tribulation. So everything I just read you happens prior. So we went backwards. We looked at Re Revelations 21, which is at the end of, of judgment. We looked at Revelations 14, which is near the end of great tribulation. We looked at Revelations 13, which is at the beginning of tribulation. Now we just looked at what precedes his return so that this would be all over the earth. 
So Jesus is telling us, do you want a barometer? He gives us two barometers. One is Israel. The other is the church. When there's complete hatred for what we believe in, you know that it's very close. Because we're living in the standard of Christianity right now. Where we go as a church is where the rest of Christianity is going to go because we support, we still support most Christians around the world in their, in their walk, in their, wherever you go, Africa, any continent. We go. Now, there's still believers coming in. This message is to the American church. You know, it's to us. It's to us. And so when you look at the sister chapters, go over to Luke 21. As Jesus said, many would be, what, offended? Many would be deceived? <clears throat> many would be overcome? The love of many would wax cold? What is that? That's apostasy, surrender, compromise of the faith. Same, same, very same three questions, and the content of the message is the same. But, but, but he, give, he fills it in a little bit more. He says, in verse 8, he says, And he said, Take heed that you be not deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And the time was drawing near, therefore do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be what? Terrified. He uses a, a different word in this gospel. For these things must come to pass first, but the end shall not come immediately. And then he said, Nation will rise against nation, kingdom kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, great earthquakes now, in various places, famines and pestilence, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all of these, they shall lay hands on In other words, before these, they'll lay hands on you, persecute you, deliver you up to synagogue and prison. You will be brought before kings and the rulers for my name's sake, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for a testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand what you will answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all of your adversaries will not be able to contradict or, or resist. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And will, will be put, some of you will be put to death. And you will be hated by all, the, by all for my name's sake. But not a hair on your head shall be lost, but your patience, and here we see it again, your patience possess your soul. And, and if you go back to Revelations 13, it says, here is the patience of the saint. It says you'll need great patience to get through or to stand, right? And so here we see patience. Just two more verses. Verse 25 says, And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, on the earth the stress of nations and perplexities, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven will be shaken. And so we see here, and I, I just want to show you the weight and gravity of this. Now, now, this, believe it or not, should not be fearful to us. <laughs> I mean, even though it's a weighty, heavy message. But I'm telling you why. I'm, I'm, a, you have to understand something. Jesus tells us, because the generation that lives through it will need to know it to get through it. Okay? He, that's why he tells us these things. He doesn't, he's not just haphazardly. He's, he's telling really us, if you believe we're the generation or the generation that does see his return is on the earth, our children and, and grandchildren, then this is very pertinent because this is the trend and direction of the world and the church. Okay? So the word the Lord gave me was, those that aren't wholehearted will not be able to stand. They'll be swept away by it. Which means they will cave, they will surrender, they will compromise, they will give into it. And he goes on to say, tell me, not only because they know the event is coming, they are not going to be prepared for the event because knowing it doesn't prepare you for it. I have to prepare you for it. Do you understand? Jesus is saying... 
I have to prepare your heart to get through what's ahead. So whatever you're going through in your life or whatever you've gone through in your life is God preparing you for what's coming ahead. If you are wholehearted to him and surrender to him, then you're in his training class to get you to that next place, to train you to where you're going to be. And, and so when you look at the scriptures and you look at what Jesus said, because when they said, Jesus, what's it going to be like? What are the signs? And what's it going to be like at the end? Everything about his answer other than prophetic events is I'm trying to prepare you who asked me, who loved me. And so he goes through, understand there's going to be great, great deceptions. Understand you're going to pick up the newspaper, you're going to watch TV, you're going to watch the news, and it's going to shake the world. But don't be shaken by it. You're going to see pestilence and famine. You're going to see new diseases. You're going to see th things coming that you, you know, SARS, AIDS, all of these acronyms that we now live with, Zika, right? I mean, where was all this stuff 100 years ago, right? Because we're moving in that, into that trend. Now, whether you believe it's, you know, next week or 100 years from now, we're moving in that trend. We're, we're, you, you can see the trend changing and the trend moving. When you, when you look at the scripture, if you would go to Matthew 7, I mean, when you look at really Jesus, because I, I, I look at it quite a bit. When you look at Jesus in Matthew 24 and 25 answering those three questions, all of it was a warning. Even the parables at the end, the evil servant, the virgins, the talents. He's talking to his servants. He's talking to his people. It's all a warning for that generation to, to live right. Here in Matthew chapter 7, Verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonderful works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you, practicer, you who practice lawlessness. Now I want you to see something here, because... We're going to go on, but I want you to see that these people are in the afterlife. They're not living. In that day, they're dead. They physically died on the earth. Okay, And they're, they're, they come up to Jesus. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, in that day, which is when? It's after. It's, after, it's not here. Right? Read it again so you get it. It says, not... <coughs> Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? You know, past tense, have we not prophesied in thy name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonderful works? They're, they're rehearsing their history, right? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you, you workers of lawlessness or practicers of lawlessness. Now, let's, let's, look at, let's look at this. How do you think they felt on the earth? Did they feel eternally secure? Did they feel close to God? Did they feel like they were working for God? Do you feel that they, do you feel that they fought, felt like they were the center of God's universe? I mean, here they are standing before the Lord. Instead of saying, thank you for what you did, they're saying, look at me and what I did. And, and as they look at it, they, they had to feel eternally secure on earth. It, they, they had to feel like they had it knocked, like they knew what they were doing, right? They had to have a feeling that they were real strong Christians. And then to be faced with Jesus and say, he, he says to them, I had absolutely no relationship with you. I didn't know you. I mean, how does that happen? Well, it says here that many will go through life believing they're eternally secure, they're on solid ground, they're the center of God's universe, and God's the center of their universe, 
What does Jesus do to separate here those that are his and those aren't his? Those that hear and do the word. That's it. He's saying, you heard the word, you didn't do the word. You thought you were. You thought you were a big Bible toter. You thought you were doing what you were supposed to do. But you had no relationship with me because you did not do the word of God. Okay? That, I mean, when you, when you back up from this, you have to look at this and you have to look at your own life and you have to say, am I hearing and doing the word of God? Otherwise, you're in the same trick. Right? I mean, it's, when, when you look at these things, you, ha you, you have to look at, you know, what's the message here? Okay? Now, the ne these are people that have, that have died because th they're not here on earth. Jesus isn't down here sitting down with Sebastian Lucido saying, let me do a job evaluation of you right here. You know, where, where, where this conversation is taking place. This is up there, okay, or on the way wherever you're going, okay? Now he goes on, because this is, this is more important. Verse 24, Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken them to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on a rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And the rains descend, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Okay, so here Jesus is teaching and he goes from the afterlife, people being deceived through their life and dealing with him, and now he turns his attention to those that are tested and tried on the earth. Because you're not tested and tried after you die. Okay? So now he's saying, those that build their house, their life, by hearing and doing the word of God, the fruit of the Spirit, right? The fruit in your life. By hearing the word and doing the word is like a man who built his house with a very strong foundation. See, it wasn't the house here. The house didn't matter. What mattered was the foundation. Both of them built a house. One's foundation was on hearing and doing the word of God. Do you see that? So, so the strength of the salvation that they missed in the earlier verses and the strength of somebody who is living life right that can stand up for the wind and the storms that are coming, because that's what we're talking about, right? We're talking about tribulation, terrifying events, you know, persecution, being able to stand against people that, you know, that are, uh, that, the, where the majority is against what you're saying, speaking out for Jesus Christ and not being ashamed. That foundation to suffer under that storm has to be very firm. That's the message the Lord is giving us today. And that's not just a weekend retreat somewhere. That's a life that's patterned after hearing and doing, hearing and doing, hearing and doing, right? So the foundation is the important piece here because both of them built a life on this foundation, okay? And, and so that foundation, the substance of that foundation really determines if you and I are going to stand in the storms that are ahead. Do you guys, can you guys tie that together? Okay, go over to, uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. It says, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given to me as a wise master builder, 
I have laid the foundation, he's an apostle, and another builds thereon. Let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So now who is the foundation of life? Jesus Christ. So the, the house that stands is firm in its relationship with Jesus Christ. The house that falls is not strong. You guys see that? Let me read it on. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble, everyone's works will become clear, for the day will declare it. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test everyone's works of what sort it is. If anyone's works that he's built thereon shall endure, he shall receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Now this is, this is the Bema seat of Christ. Okay, let me explain this. I only brought this up to show you the foundation, because... Because we, we have to get there. We have to understand what's the, what's the prescription for the remedy of our house being strong, okay? But I want to show you this. The foundation here is secure for salvation because there is a true belief in Jesus Christ. So get an image in your mind. Let's use me. There's a pile in front of me of gold, silver, precious stone, and wood, hay, and stubble. I'm going to stand before God. Fire is going to reveal and burn up the wood, hay, and stubble. That's not sin, because we're saved. Sin has already been dealt with, okay? The wood, hay, and stubble are the righteous acts that we've done with the wrong heart. If I give a check and say, hey, look at me, right? Here's $100,000 for the church. What does Matthew tell us? You have your reward. There's no reward attached to it. If I pray to be seen of men, you have your reward. If I, if I fast to be seen of men, you have your... What is that? That's a lack of faith. So it's a righteous act that I think I should have value in, but I, there's no value in it, so it's going to burn up. The gold, silver, precious stones are the same acts that are done with the right heart, the heart of love, the heart of faith, right? Do you see? But what I wanted you to see here, that's sort of a side teaching, what I wanted you to see here is the foundation is Jesus Christ. So when we look at, when, when God tells us, the Holy Spirit tells us that if you're not wholehearted, you'll be swept away. If your foundation isn't firm and strong, in who? Jesus Christ, it'll be what? You'll be what? You'll be moved out of place and you'll collapse. Now if you go over to go over to John chapter 14. <coughs> This is probably one of the last, this is the last teaching that Jesus did to his closest guys. Verse 15, John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. Look at verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Look at verse 23. And Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the words which you hear is not mine, but it's the Father who sent me. These things have I spoken to you while I was yet being present with you. So, you know, when you, when you back up from this, and you look at, what he's saying here is he's saying, if you have faith in me as the one who paid for your sins, your iniquities, your transgressions, that I, I'm speaking as Jesus, that I took your sins that you should have paid for and your transgressions and your iniquities and all that you did in your life, your shame, your guilt, your separation from God, I took that penalty for you. And so I suffered instead of you suffering. And all I ask from you is that you have faith in me for what I did for you, right? So that you glorify me as the one who did that as your Lord and Savior. So that you love me, you have faith in me, and you glorify me. That's salvation. Do you understand? 
It's not thinking you know Jesus. It's glorifying Jesus for who He is. Okay? Because He came here for a full-time, 24-7 bride. Not somebody that visits on Sunday. Okay? So the faith in who we are, the foundation in who we are, is, is as strong as our faith, our love, and our glorification of Jesus Christ. If you're not doing that, you won't be able to stand. If you're not lifting Jesus up so he's the Lord of your whole life, you will not be able to stand in what's coming. Look at the rich young ruler. Comes and kneels. What does he say? What should I do to inherit the kingdom of God? Right? What is he, what, he said, I, do the commandments. Jesus said, you know, uh, you know, he gives them the human element. Don't kill, don't covet, all of that, right? He, 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 the guy said, yeah, I do that. He said, you're lacking one thing. Go sell all that you have, pick up your cross and follow me. The Bible said that he left very sorry because he couldn't do that. That's not wholehearted. What did he do? He lost the opportunity to walk with the Lord. Luke, lukewarm church in Revelation chapter 3, I wish that you were hot or cold. Because you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That's, that's half-hearted. That's not all in. That's living one, one leg in the world, one leg in the other world. Do you guys see that? So the Lord's telling me right now, the message that I'm preaching is if you're not wholehearted, get there. Pick up the word, look at it, evaluate your life, and try to figure out where you're in error so that you can make it right. Do you follow? And it's not being perfect, because none of us are perfect. But if we're convicted by our sin and we're moving toward Jesus, we're getting better and better every day. Amen? And, and, and so when he says here, he's saying, listen, if people love me, They'll keep my words. They're gonna. They're, they're gonna. As as a Lord and Savior, they're gonna know that they. You know, we should wake up every day and say, "I only have breath because He gave it to me. I only have life because He gave it to me. I only have a family because He gave it to me. Every blessing in my life is from Him." Do you guys see that? Okay. Now here's the problem. Here's the problem. What what was the difference with the Matthew seven church? They heard the word, but they didn't do the word, right? But I'll tell you, believing in man's doctrine and believing something other than the truth because some great preacher, teacher, or pastor put it together for you is equivalent to not knowing the word and not doing the word. Remember the Ark of the Covenant, David moving the Ark, right? They were all happy and joyous. It was all right in their eyes, but it wasn't according to the word. What did God do? In the middle of their mega church event, singing and praising, he killed somebody. Why? It wasn't according to his word. We don't have the right to edit. Okay? So, so the bigger problem here is that the American church is not teaching the American Christians how to fortify their hearts to stand against what's coming. Because they're worried about keeping them. They're worried about losing them. We're really worried about losing the budgets. We're worried about losing the money. In the meantime, when everything hits the fan, you're gonna, you can't prepare for a hurricane in the midst of it. Okay? Can you tell something's wrong? Look at our presidential campaign. Out of 310 million people, this is what we picked. I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're laughing, but there's no good news. You know, but, but this is, and then look at Europe, okay? So, so just looking ahead, studying this stuff, what I believe is going to happen, first of all, we're going we're gonna to shut down at some point, and I'm going to do a news blog that's not going to be live, that I'm going to do with you, it's going to be recorded. But, but when, you, when you look at where we are right now, and, and the things that are unfolding before our eyes in, in the news cycle, we're very, very close. I believe that the generation to see Jesus will return on the earth, okay? I don't know if I'm young enough, okay? Cause, but, but I have to tell you, there's not much more that has to fall in place, okay? Let me tell you how I think things unfold, 
Okay, can I do that? I believe that there's going to be a backlash by the citizens of the nations of the Western world, Europe and the United States, that's going to say, get these people out of this country as soon as you can. They're going to come to a place where they're going to elect leaders that are going to say, get them out of here now. We want our neighborhoods back, our schools back, we don't want to live in fear, okay? Right now the trend has been ultra-liberal, allowing refugees to come in, good and bad. There's more good than bad, but the bad magnify the situation. And what's going to happen is, whether you believe it or not, the countries of the world are going to purge the very people they let in. It's the same thing Hitler did with the Jews. That re identified the religion. They weren't tolerant to the religion, so they purged the nation of the religion. You follow? The same thing is going to, we're going to be grouped into, eventually, not being tolerant toward the greater human good. Let me just give you the, the prime example of what divides us. Homosexuality divides us. It's wrong. It's the same sin as adultery. Okay? Regardless if you like the person or not, it's sin. Okay? And, 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 you know, and, and, you know, everyone's family has somebody in that sin. Everyone's family has people in all different sins. To me, it's the same sin. I don't look down on, on somebody who's living that sin or look down on somebody who's in adultery. I look down at the sin that they're all in. Okay? The difference is that our, the world has embraced and glorified one of the sins. And when we speak, we aren't speaking our faith. You're a hater because they love each other. You hate them. No, we don't. We'll clothe them. We'll pray for them. We'll feed them. We'll clothe them. Same as any other sinner, right? We don't agree with the lifestyle. It's the same thing with other lifestyles that we don't agree with, okay? But, but we're fighting a battle where overwhelmingly the narrative from governments is you're not tolerant. You're, 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 we're going against the herd. Remember early on, we're going against the herd. We don't agree with it because our God says, well, your God is the God of love. These two love each other. Why shouldn't they be happy? What gives you the right? Do you, do you guys see that? Do you hear, do you hear how... To someone who doesn't know the truth, we sound like we're not tolerant and we're a hater of them. We don't hate anybody. In fact, most of us would die for them. We'd give our life, we'd give, we'd give our last dollar. That, it's not the people that we hate. It's the sin that we, de that we detest. Okay? And we can't have a government that glorifies it and we speak against it. This is the... This is the Conundrum, this is the issue that we have as we move forward over the next decade where religion is going to become an issue. And, and, and unfortunately, if there's, there's somebody who's in Islam that's against it and somebody who's a Christian that's against it, we're the same in their eyes. We're against something that, that doesn't hurt anybody because these two people love each other. You guys see that? So that when, that's a storm coming at us to where, where do you believe? What do you stand for? Are you going to be able to proclaim against the masses? I believe in what the Word of God says. I'm not for it. I'm against it. I don't believe in it. I don't think it. Look at what happened in North Carolina. I mean, they changed the NBA All-Star game because of the governor making a law that that whatever you're born with, male or female, use that bathroom. I mean, they're penalizing him. You know, PayPal's not building there. They're penalizing a man who stood. They're, they're penalizing bakers who don't want to bake a cake. We're in America. We're in the United States. We don't know how to live this way. We're going to have to learn. We're going to have to learn. Do you guys see the message? Do you understand that and the church is really working against it by not bringing up a demand, an expectation that God demands that you obey the word of God. Don't tiptoe around it. You know, you don't need, 
you know, some consultants that come in to tell you how to build a church. It's the anointing of God that builds the church, not you and not the think tank. Just preach the word. Use the gift God gave you. And you'll build the church. The people that will get behind that. When we start worrying about people and people's feelings, we're going to hurt them anyway. You know, there are people that will be offended at this message when they watch it. They'll say, well, that's not the God I serve. I don't believe in what you're saying. I believe if two people love each other, no matter who they are, they should be able to get married. I, you know, I believe this, I believe that. No, listen, I believe one thing, and that's God's word. If it's not there, I don't care what you think. I have to go with his word. I'll love you, but I have to go with his word. Churches have to get back to teaching the word of God and forget entertainment. Amen. Just teach the word. Bring it. You know, we need to hear it. They'll all be happy later. Trust me. Because of what's coming, because I believe a lot of pastors in this land have the word. And, but, they're, but, they're, but they're teaching what they're teaching because numbers and budgets and money means more. But when things start falling apart, you know, well, how, do you, how do you prepare somebody? Well, everything I told you is, you know, is not correct. You have to do the word. You have to live that way. You know, the Bible says you have to bear fruit. If you're not bearing fruit, you're cut off as a branch and you're burned. Do you guys see that? Do you understand? So, so today's message, threefold, wholehearted, be swept away. The American, uh, uh, or in, in knowing an event's coming doesn't mean preparing for it. Tuesday night, I'm teaching on preparation of the heart, preparing for tribulation. So it's like a, a part two to this will be Tuesday night. If you can't come, watch it. But, and then the third piece is, as an American, we're at a disadvantage because we've never had to fight this battle. I mean, especially those of us with graying hair. Never had to fight this battle that we're fighting now. And, and so we're fighting it now. So anyway, I'm going to close this section down in prayer. Um, so let's bow our heads. Father, we just thank you for our time together. We thank you for this word, Lord God. I just pray in the name of Jesus, Father, that, Father, this word would, Father, not only resonate in our hearts, but, Father, you would, you would continue, Father, to expand this word, this message in our hearts and minds. And, Father, our desire here is, Father, we know there's the good and acceptable, but our, our desire here is to do your perfect will, to be vessels and instruments of your perfect will, Father. And so we pray in the name of Jesus, Father, that you would speak to us individually and lead us and guide us into your perfect will. And, Father, we just give you glory and praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.